Coming up on Theater Talk. David, you've yes. written years of these fantastic monologues for yourself. Mm -hmm. Why hand this magnificent Harry Clark over to Billy Crudup? It's too difficult to perform. <laughs> <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, and I am joined today by my guest co-host, Jason Zinneman of the New York Times, critic and comedy columnist, correct? Good to be here, yes. that's right. We are here to talk about the magnificent play, Harry Clark, now at the Manetta Lane Theater. It was started at the Vineyard Theater. It's been moved by Audible, and here it is. It is written by David Kale, a monologuist, right, would you say? For years, Primarily, yeah. For years, yeah. creating his own m theatrical pieces of one person monologues. Yep. It's directed by Lee Silverman, who last did Violet. Well, not last did Violet. I know you're working on the time, but you did Violet. You did the wonderful play I'm Blocking that had the Jane Hoodie Shell in the chair. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, Jane Hoodie Shell, yes, yes. And it stars, and it stars the great Billy Crudup who I first saw in Arcadia way back in the day. Oh, wow. And yeah. you have just been killing it ever since. Thank you very much. So, David, you've yes. written years of these fantastic monologues for yourself. Mm -hmm. Why hand this magnificent Harry Clark over to Billy Crudup? It's too difficult to perform. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, th I, felt, I felt someone else could do it better. I could, could realize it, take it further and make it deeper. And it was very intuitive feeling this. And I hadn't felt it with any of the other shows, but this one I did and, and here we are. And here we are. Yeah. Did you feel that when you were writing it or when it was finished? I performed it in Pittsburgh for three performances at the Andy Warhol Museum. Oh, you did perform it? Oh. Yeah, to, um, but partly to feel out the script and how it was going to be with people. It was a bit, it was different to any of the other shows that I'd done and it was written very intuitively and very instinctively and I wasn't quite sure what I had. But I felt that at that moment I thought, I just felt that this, this, I shouldn't be performing this. Tell those who have not had the privilege of seeing Harry Clark what it's about. Harry Clark is um, the story about a man <laughs> who is living a, a somewhat complicated, seemingly potentially double life and kind of the um, way that he's found himself in New York and how he's chosen to get by. And it's hard to talk about too much because yes. there's a certain amount of mystery to the evening. It's really a triple life, isn't it, Billy? Um, there, I think there is a, a young person in there who has a kind of fractured association with his identity. Well, and what's, what's your character's initial name? Philip Brugelstein. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so I think this is a chapter in what has been a book of him wrestling with his identity. And this one, this one chapter involves a sort of id character that has been a part of his existence um, that has never really had an adult experience. So it's kind of letting that tough young kid out into the world. And have uh, a seemingly a adult, <laughs> adult experience. Not seemingly, I tell you, in this play it's a very adult experience. Yes. Very adult. Why did you write about Philip Brugelstein from Illinois? I had some family that were living in Illinois, so I spent a little bit of time there. And I, and I was, spent time also in, I guess this did actually influence the show. I spent time in a very small town where it was quite distinctly dangerously homophobic. Mm -hmm. So the idea of this kind of kid with whose sexuality could be this, this, or all of the above, it's like that alienation and that terror of of not of just you can't live fully in a situation like that. Well, and I think that part um, of what makes the that, piece so exciting is that Philip himself is an unreliable narrator to his life. Yeah. So, so that you're as you're listening to him tell this story and live in this story in this way, there's there comes a time I think for the audience where they start to feel like, 
oh, oh, I see. He doesn't know even why he's doing the things that he's doing. So that everything about it has an innocence to it, which I think is part of the fun well, like, of the well, night. One thing, I mean, it struck me about, this is a play about people adopting other personas. Yeah. And in that shift, it really happens without an excess of self-examination. It happens almost yeah. effortlessly. Yeah. And I wonder if the, how intentional that is. And is that something that you think happens much more common than we otherwise think? Mm -hmm. Like, is this a much more ordinary story than it appears? For me, it is. I'll tell you, we're, we're all sitting here at socialized in very similar kind of clothing. You know, we do this in uh, explicit and implicit ways all the time. The, the ways that we try to navigate our social place in the world as you know, social animals. It's just a part of uh, the fabric of our thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, I think, in develop when in developmentally, when things traumatic things happen that make them feel disassociated from their own sense of self, um, any number of things can happen to make them think that the right way to fit in is to pantomime a persona. So I see that happening in the world all the time. This is an extraordinary circumstance that uh, I think also just happens to be entertaining as well. You're saying that in our, in our normal day, we're always sort of putting on masks, adjusting our personas in, in subtle ways. Um, and that made me think in this, in this show, am I thinking about it wrong? Is Harry Clark this you know, kind of clothes that this guy puts on or puts, or, and, and takes off? Or, you know, is it something that's essential about who he is? Like, is this whole idea about like, who you really are different considering what you're saying about how much we're always shifting? Well, it's like, I mean, this is a, a dramatic example, but like we were talking about Dame Edna Everidge. Yeah. And Barry Humphreys, like Edna, I, is Edna much freer and much ruder than Barry? You know, well, that's an interesting. You know, it's like there's, there, there's there's an element of is I mean I don't know I don't know Barry Humphreys but um, but I do love it. But did you ever see the crass politician but, he does? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I forgot about that. I mean, I know like as a child, I had this little um, character that I would do that I was I was much funnier as this character than I was, and I was kind of freed up and I would be rude with. Um, so I mean, I know what. This, I've I, I've had some experience of having a little alter ego. I mean, Harry. And you have much, that in the play that this character is a child is doing the much more engaging. Oh yeah, he's the doing, child, the, same he's kind doing of thing. the same yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was so intrigued while I watched it, thinking of you writing this, developing this, and it's so comp. How many character? I mean, how many voices are you doing? I'm 19. not sure. Okay, nineteen. 19. 19. Yeah. Sometimes I do fewer. Sometimes <laughs> I do more. Never know exactly what's yeah. going to happen. I mean, it's sometimes. So, it's I invented one last night. <laughs> and somebody got a whole yeah. new voice. The uh, the uh, manager at the restaurant got a oh, whole new oh, voice. Oh, oh. You you yeah. know exactly. You have a, you have an answer to that. Nineteen, and I you do. say you don't know. <laughs> Why do you have them all mapped out? Oh, we had script? to count them out. You yeah. Yeah. At one point, we had, we were asked how many characters was Billy was playing, and. Um, it's 19. Some of them are, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, my attempt to fully manifest and inhabit, and others are uh, my, uh, my attempt to interpret by way of one of the other storytellers. Uh -huh. So, you know, uh, Philip may just give you a, a brief sketch of this one character. Doesn't really go into detail about, you know, like who the woman who serves the drink on the beach is, you know, or I don't try to really embody her for the one sentence that she has, but she's probably included in the 19 mm. um, characters, as opposed to somebody like Ruth or Stephanie or um, Mark, you know, that I really try to inhabit. What about, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about accents, because there's a lot of different shades of accents, at least, at least in my ear, and uh, how did you think about, and also there's a question of like a, a good accent or a bad accent and, and how that plays into character. Well, I, I, I make every attempt to be as uh, authentic as I can with a point of view about who Philip is, where he's from, um, what he's interested in, like who, who he's interested in pantomiming because obviously he's from Illinois and the 
the people that he's pantomiming uh, or trying to mimic rather um, are would have been TV stars, would have been movie stars. So mm -hmm. which are the stars that he was interested in and which version of them could he do? So mm. part of our rehearsal at the beginning was trying to figure out, okay, where does a natural Philip kind of fit in? And it may not be the immaculate English accent that he thinks he has. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, it will be something authentic for Philip, for his mm -hmm. creation and his whole journey. Um, and then there's the character of Harry, which is another fictional creation. And part of that accent is also about attitude. Yeah. And so there is the intention to be brash and open and irreverent. And I have to say part of my journey has been less about being sound perfect throughout the entire thing with all of my focus on that as opposed to making an earnest effort to understand the point of view we're coming from and then to sell it as the uh, as the characters themselves since nobody is really from England. Yeah, we don't know what's perfect. Um, but, but David was the Harry. I asked him to change the line at the beginning. By the way, which what, one? What, yeah. Oh, which um, one is that? The, the opening line is, "I can always do an immaculate English <laughs> accent." So why did you ask him to change that? Well, because I can't. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Sometimes my accent's pretty good, but you know, sometimes you're in the but middle of the I show. Say, like part of the athletic unbelievable performance that Billy's giving is that sometimes within the course of a sentence, he's three or four yes. different people. Sometimes that spans between gender, age, and accent. So it's not just accent, it's also, and in any given, at any given time, I mean, this isn't true throughout, but certainly there are just moments that are um, completely virtuosic because he starts out as Philip, he then does a little bit of Harry, and then transforms into somebody else altogether. And that is, um, th that sharp, turn that nimbleness is so was so difficult i think to achieve so it's so much more than like accent work mm -hmm. i want to say yeah. which is that it's also physicality it's intention it's clarity of purpose for all of the characters he's playing and the and the journey just even in one sentence forget in an hour and 20 minutes of having to do that constantly throughout it's quite muscular who came on board first did you lee or did you billy in this production. I, yeah. right. And then what did David and Lee, what made you know Billy was the one to do it? Well, come on. <laughs> no, 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 he's a wonderful actor, but, but, yeah. you, but yeah. you, I don't know. I'm with you. you. What? I said, I'm with you. I, yeah. I got no, the call I, and I was like, yeah. what? No, Why? No, when did you say, Why? oh, we'll get Billy crewed up. You, I mean, you know, where did that, where did that come from? It came together very quickly. Yeah. David called me um, in like the end of July, yeah. I think, yeah. and it came. The whole thing really just came together in the most incredible, quick, quick way. And um, the first person that we talked about was Billy. And but what, it, to why did he come to your mind? Uh, you know, of, there's, of all the actors, I mean, maybe you were friends with him. Maybe maybe no, Doug Abel no. at the at the at the Vineyard said Billy Crudup. Uh, uh, you, you see, but uh, my height. <laughs> <laughs> it was the right height. Yeah. I mean, Doug. Doug. Doug brought me into audition to play Liberace for something, which I was mystified by. But the, um, <laughs> and did an uncanny imitation of Liberace. I'll bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fluke, I couldn't I'll repeat. bet you no, did. But, but, the, but all I was, we, we had just like decided to do it. And, and Doug said, I'm looking to, into Billy's availability. And I was like, he's it. Right, because He's Doug Abel, it. who runs the Vineyard yes, Theater and yeah. is a casting director and is a brilliant guy, so yeah, I'm not surprised that he didn't. Yeah. That's also the first play, the uh, first place I ever yeah. did a play in New yeah. York yeah. Yeah. was at the Vineyard Theater, yeah. um, which was before Arcadia. Arcadia. Uh, it was a play by Chiori Miyagawa um, called America Dreaming, directed by Michael Mayer. Um, and so I have a lot of uh, romantic attachment to the Vineyard. Um, and I also did a, an Adam Rapp play there later uh, before that. And my girlfriend at the time was in a show there for a long time. So Doug Abel has been uh, in, in my close group of people, you know, that I've really uh, been grateful for and admired for a long time. So um, when he calls and says, hey, this is a piece that I think might be interesting, there's no way I would have read a one-person show. Have you done a one-person show before? No. 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 So wow. I've barely done any show. What, like <laughs> what did you learn about, I mean, that's a different form, and, and you're yeah. someone who's a real master of it. What's the, is there something particular that you learned about that form uh, that you didn't know? It's a horrible about? idea. Uh, <laughs> it wrecks your nervous system. Uh, 
your shadow of your former self. <laughs> um, there actually, it has been an extraordinary learning experience, and and uh, I've gotten the the great gift of having David's support, uh, having performed it, and Lee's support, having directed them, um, because it can be quite intimidating. You can rehearse all you want, but at a certain point your brain can't take in anymore. Yeah. And then there's a deadline to when the show is going to be in front of people. And the, the, it doesn't matter whether or not you're fully prepared for that preview. Um, it's gonna come and you're gonna have to manage it. And so they were really expert at helping me navigate the, the pressure of not just performing the story um, that we uh, um, rehearsed and described and decided to make our night of theater, but dealing with being out there alone. But what about, I mean, this is one I talked to you about before, about when you're in a solo show, there is this question you don't have necessarily in an ensemble, which is who are you talking to? What's your relationship with the audience? The big portion of our discussion about this piece. I mean, I don't want to give you an idea of precisely what we settled on because I think part of the mystery of the piece and the experience of our night of theater is you're never entirely sure if he's in the room with you or you're in his mind or where you are exactly. You get some indications from the set maybe. Um, but I think that makes for something quite interesting. But that being said, we had to have lots of conversations for me specifically because that's how I work as an actor. I, I'm like, well, the last place Philip Brugelstein is is the Vineyard Theater. He is not at the Vineyard <laughs> Theater, okay? We know that. So if he's not there and he's not talking to the audience at the Vineyard Theater, where is he and who is he talking to and why? But you're right down there. I saw you at the Manila Lane Theater where you are now. You, but you are such a fascinating state of creating all these characters and yet you're so close to us. Well, you do a lot of things as an actor all the time to uh, put up a fourth wall. You know, yeah, we call it a fourth yeah. wall. If it, you know, these cameras aren't here, you know, when you're trying to do a movie and behave as though something is very simple and um, behavior that's going to feel natural, you've got, you know, 50 people working around you in time. So you're used to compartmentalizing. Mm -hmm. That being said, you're not used to compartmentalizing while interacting with the people that you're trying to compartmentalize yourself from. Right. So that is a very different kind of uh, exercise and one that... And you're and deceiving yourself. You have to. You yeah. have to, yeah. And it's also impossible to By the rehearse. way, actors do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. But you're deceiving the other... Now, David, what's... Monologists your... never do it. What's your answer to that question? I've seen you do what? so many wonderful monologues. But when you're up there, where are you? Like, who is the audience? Yeah, who's the audience? <laughs> it's Billy Crudup. <laughs> it's a sea of Billy Crudup. Um, I'm very supportive, by the way. <laughs> for me, the audience is the audience. So it's... That's the answer for a lot of yeah. monologues. It's, it's true. Yeah. They, they, the, it, the, it's the experience of um, expressing yourself in that environment that you kind of go, all right, well, they're not anyone specific. Yeah, or... Uh, you know, I, it's not actually. It's not totally that with me. I mean, it kind of there's, there's there's some shows where it is, and there's others where it's in and out, and it's actually more akin. Wait, why is the audience? Let's, we have a we have what? a genuine disagreement. So what? let's 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 probe it. Who is it. this audience? Why is the audience the audience when you're in a solo show? You know, I just don't think about it. I just I just want to communicate something, and there's people in the room, and they. We call them the audience. I don't know. I've never watched a video of myself or I've never watched myself on any form. Mm -hmm. I did an HBO special in the 80s where they filmed the monologue. I've never watched it. I just, I, I like not knowing. But it seems so essential to this, because this time. show, Harry, one thing about Harry Clark is he's incredibly seductive. Yeah. Right? Is there something about the fact there is this persona that makes him so seductive? He's, he's so successfully seductive. He's seducing somebody. He's not just, he's not by himself. There's somebody else there he's seducing. Who, who he's talking to is not an irrelevant point. point I couldn't no. agree more. Yeah. Uh, I'm just not going to give you my answer for who uh, he's talking okay. to. Um, but I, to, to David's point, so the reason we talk about who you're talking about yeah. um, as actors is intention. The only reason any of us open our mouths is because we have an intention. You know, right. Whether it means you're doing that uh, at home alone and you need to hear the thought come out of your mouth and articulate it, or whether or not you're trying to explain to something to someone on a talk show about right. how you're acting. We always have intention, and that's one of the, you know, motivation is one of the primary things that you use. So 
what I think David was saying is he has a motivation when he writes this story. It's to tell the story to people. So the, it's implicit in a monologuist's understanding of the performance itself. Right. That's the motivation is right. to speak to a group of people. Actors don't have that kind of motivation. We look for the other characters. We look for um, some kind, even, you know, uh, some of the great uh, solilo soliloquies and stuff. They're meant to be like mental uh, uh, explorations. So an opportunity for the audience to overhear something that's going on in their head. Part of the event in a solo show is the actor needs to be different. The character, the story needs to be different at the end than it was at the beginning. So the actual act of talking has transformed the person. Mm -hmm. It's not just the story itself that's the event. It's the act of telling the story an event has occurred. And that is different than I think a monologue or um, like a Spalding Gray or somebody who um, is has a different sense of the kind of story that they're telling where the point of the evening is not the transformation but the story itself. So you're saying David With my shows when I'm performing them there's still like 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 the script for for Harry Clark there's still scenes between characters and then I lose the audience it's just m me playing this person and this person Ella Harry, um, but it's, yeah, that's all I'm, well, I'm going to say. Yeah, but I think that there's, <laughs> there's theatricality to it sometimes, and sometimes yeah. there's not. Like, sometimes the point of Eric Bogosian and some of his pieces. Like, yeah. he's not playing a character, he's telling a story, and that's a different theatrical event than I think what Harry Clark is doing, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Which it is a very point. specific piece of writing, too, oh, yes. mm -hmm. where the points of view shift, um, and so part of, I think, the experience of rehearsing it was us discovering what the three of us thought this piece was, mm -hmm. what we thought this was, uh, what this event was gonna be. Yeah. And part of it was uh, an exploration in Philip, Philip trying to understand where he is in his life. Philip Rugelstein back Philip in Illinois, Rugelstein, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and part of it was um, you, you get, you as an audience, get to witness scenes erupt in front of you. Mm, um, right. And so there's a, there's a couple of different theatrical devices that are in play that I think make for um, a very unique piece of writing. Stuff happens, it's got so, violence, yeah. it's got sex, it's yeah. got all of, a lot going, it's got romance. It's got deception. Sade. <laughs> Let's not got forget Sade. Sade. Why yeah. Sade? Got Sade. Because Sade is Sade. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 she's, that she's an important element in this plot. Yes, she is. I mean, I just think part of what's so interesting about the conversation about what the show is, is that you can't actually, like, we rehearsed the show, but you it's so hard in a solo show because you actually don't know what the scene partner is until you do it in front of them. So you're trying to rehearse a, a thing without knowing the full picture of what it is. And so the form sort of reveals itself in performance. It's not something that you can rehearse. Mm -hmm. And so there's this crazy thing that happens, which is that you're kind of building a thing, but you can't actually see the, you can't see the whole vessel until you're in front of an audience. And that makes for an incredibly, um, kind of challenging rehearsal process because you th you're you're trying to sh um, sculpt an event mm. that's not going to be made clear it's not going to be legible to any of us until Billy gets out and does it in front of an audience and then that the shape of it sort of remains intact night to night but the character that he's acting opposite changes radically night to night. Mm. So also his ability to navigate that, to let the, the, the sort of same event happen night after night, no matter who he's acting opposite. One thing that struck me uh, is that there are some similarities between the story of this play and Dear Evan Hansen. And I don't want to go into, because uh, I, I can see you guys don't want to know spoilers, but they both involve someone who insinuates themselves in, in a family and they involve some deception. Deception. And one thing that was struck me about Dear Evan Hansen is I was surprised how much the audience loved this character yeah. and forgive, forgave this character mm. every night. Really, it's a, th their reaction was actually different than mine. I mean, you don't want to judge them, but are you, su are you surprised how the audience reacts to Harry Clark? I make sure that they get an opportunity to love him in the way that we love him and in the way that the Schmitz love him. That should be 100% sincere you do because it, yeah. that is an effort to try to be in the world. You know, that is the thing that I think he is really 
um, holding um, deep in his soul if he's got one as a fictional creation. You know, it's that it is meant to be an engagement in the world, which ultimately I think all of us relate to. All the impediments in our lives that keep us from doing the things that we want to do, from loving the people we want to love, from being, a part, being ambition, uh, ambitious in the way we want to be ambitious. Harry Clark says, forget that. Let's just let's live, let our lives um, lead us along and go on for the ride. So that, to me, I think is probably attractive to a lot of people. No, and it was very important for me that Harry was enjoyable. And the audience would enjoy Harry. He, uh, he, Does he, make you feel uncomfortable too. That's one of the things about the show, which I think is exciting, is you're not left with um, uh, some sense of resolution at the end. It ends on kind of a minor key, which mm -hmm. I think is a very humane treatment of this kind of person. He's enjoyable. He's very lovable. And it is a wonderful, brilliant play and an amazing performance by you, Billy you. Crudup, and quite a job by you, Lisa. Thank Roman. you, yes. thank you. David Kale, congratulations on this thank wonderful you. play at the Minetta Lane Theater. It is Audible presenting a Vineyard Theater production now at the Minetta Lane. And it, you're leaving May 13th, I'm sorry to say, but this is available on Audible and really would be quite something extraordinary to listen to on Audible. I, yes, I think. So thank you so much, Harry Clark. Get to see it. Thank you, Jason Zinnemann, Thank you, as Zinnemann. always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, right, you. Thank you. Thanks. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you. <laughs>